What's up everybody, it's Galmadex, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and today we're going to be playing another premiere draft of the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Without further ado, let's get into our pack one pick one, which has several really sweet options. We've got a Dinosaur Focus Rare here, which is going to be a two-mana Mana Dork, tapping for a man of any color, that can also start recasting some Dinosaur cards from graveyards later on. You can exile them for that two mana, and then cast them off of the Paleontologist. There's also the Caprocti Sunborn, which is pretty insane in this format. There are plenty of token generators, either producing treasure tokens, map tokens, or uh, little 1-1 one -one creature tokens, and you can tap those things down whenever you attack with a Sunborn to discover three, flip a spell from your deck with mana value three or less, and cast it for free, so that's a huge card advantage engine. And there's also an Abrade here for just really efficient removal. So I think Paleontologist, Abrade, and Sunborn are all incredible options to go for here, but we'll scoop up a Paleontologist, see if we can head into a dinosaur direction, potentially. For pick two, another incredible pack, we see the Spyglass Siren, which is a phenomenal one-drop, one mana, one one flyer that comes with a map token to help you explore and set up your draws. Card is incredible. There's also an Ultek Cloud Guard, probably White's best common. Creating two creatures off of the one spell is always going to be great in this format. There's a lot of ways to use multiple bodies, either you can tap both down to something like the Sunborn, you can sacrifice the gnome to some kind of craft effect, plenty of, plenty of good ways to use this card. There's also a braid here, again, for that cheap removal. We've also got the Great Mistake for a nice dual-colored card to put us in a certain direction. Obviously, it doesn't go with our Paleontologist, but still a powerful card there. If we want to be completely glued to Paleontologist right off the bat, we probably take a Braid here, trying to head into green-red. I think that's a pretty reasonable pick, because a Braid is also just a fantastic card, but I think the best cards in this pack are easily the left column here. The Ultek Cloud Guard, the Spyglass Siren, or the Braid. We'll go for the Braid off of this pick. For pick number three, we're seeing nothing in green, and the red spell is not so great in green-red. I think this is really good in red, blue, red, white, the kind of decks that do have the most access to a bunch of token providers. So, not going to be good in green-red dinos, so it looks like we immediately might already be having a bad time trying to play a dino deck with the Paleontologist. One of the sad things about the format, I think that... Uh, the dinosaur's archetype is a perfectly reasonable archetype, it's perfectly powerful, but because it's dinosaurs, it's just naturally going to be overdrafted a lot, so it's kind of hard to end up in a draft bar where you can actually play the dino's deck just because people like dinosaurs too much. Um, so we've got a Ruin Lurker Bat here, we've got a Miner's Guide Wing for just really efficient little flyers. I think those are both pretty fine. The Cave Crawler is nice if you can get Descend, and Join the Dead is pretty great removal no matter what. Probably just go for the Join the Dead here, grab a solid removal spell if we end up getting pushed towards black. Once again, we see no dino cards in red or green. There are some fine cards for other archetypes. Staggering Size being a fine card for any deck, just being an efficient combat trick. And then Dowsing Device being good for aggressive artifact producing decks. But again, nothing big for dino stuff. And honestly, nothing much in this pack for anybody. I suppose there's like a Merfolk Cave Diver for a blue-green explore-focused deck. That could be cute. Um, but yeah, nothing nothing incredible here, nothing super exciting. I suppose we can just take the staggering size. Not a bad trick for the cost. Yeah, not a huge fan of that pack. We'll just take a staggering size. Pick number five. Once again, zero dinosaurs, but we do see a pick five master's guide mural could be a solid sign for the blue-white craft deck. Blue-white as an archetype, as you can see by this signpost uncommon, is going to be playing a lot of artifacts and crafting with them later in the game. So to do that, you're going to exile an artifact from the battlefield or from your graveyard to flip your craft card. So with the guide mural, you're going to flip it into the master's manufactory that can then spit out a 4-4 four four every turn, as long as you've played an artifact that turn. So, card is really, really good. It's pretty slow, but quite good. It's a 5-mana 4-4 four four up front to make sure you at least get some stats off of it immediately. And once it flips, it is going to take over the game. So I'm going to take the Guide Mural here and potentially, yeah, potentially pivot towards blue-white craft as that is looking open when we're going to get the signpost uncommon this late whereas dinosaurs we've seen 
basically zero dinosaurs. We actually see a poison dart frog this pack, which is the first pretty reasonable card for green red dinos that we've had in a while. But uh, if we get two guide murals in a row, we're going to head in that direction instead. Now we've got not much here. There's, I don't know, I guess a buried treasure for pretty mediocre fixing. There's the Envoy of Okanaka Howe, which is a 3-3 three, three for 3 at worst, which is a fine stat line. And then you've got a decent mana sink on it later. That mana sink giving you artifact creatures, which could be used as craft fodder. But yeah, none of these cards are really exciting for blue-white craft. I guess we take the pretty filler Envoy. Or there's a ramp tree for trying to ramp up into big dinos if we still want to keep that path open. Think I just take the Envoy here. Don't think that green-red path is going to work out too well. But now blue and white are pretty dry. I don't think the Song of Stupefaction is particularly good, and the Council of Echoes is a lot of mana. If you consistently have Descend, it is worth it for the mana cost, the 4-4 flyer that bounces something, but it's never going to be incredible for the cost like the Guide Mural can be when we flip it. So I am actually going to take our first Dinosaur, the Pathfinding Axe Draw here. I think it is just straight up the best card in the pack. And I guess we'll have this backup plan still in our heads here. We are kind of equally deep into green red dinos and blue white craft now and here nothing good for the blue white artifact craft deck just some mediocre equipment that we can play early so i would rather grab a solid dinosaur for the top end in green red now there is a stone tree for ramp into some big six mana dinos like the cavern stomper or there's Wailing Pirates, which can stun things when you're a deck with a bunch of artifacts in it, like Blue-White is going to be. Or the Gem Guard, if we're a deck with a lot of extra tokens sitting around like we might have. These are both potentially pretty good in Blue-White. A uh, Stone Tree, potentially solid in Green-Red. I guess I will take the Stone Tree. Alright, I mean, the first half of Pack 1 really didn't look like Dinos was going to go anywhere, but we got a pretty late Axe Draw, pretty late Stomper... And then a stone tree, which is fine, so maybe it'll work out. I do like the puzzle door quite a bit in uh, craft decks. Maybe to the point where I take it over Charter Course. Don't know if I'm supposed to, but I'm going to take it over Charter Course here because the thing that's really nice about this is you get a perfectly reasonable little draw spell for two mana. One to play it, one to sack it later. And then you just have an artifact sitting in your graveyard that you can craft with later. So it's a pretty good fuel for a craft deck. Uh, none of these are exciting. Sure, we'll take a Cave Diver, I guess. None of these are super exciting. Take a Cataract in case we end up in blue. I don't think Hit the Mother Load is going to be particularly good. It is so much mana and so random. Now an Out of Air, and we find out what we get in pack number two. Alright, pack two, pick one. We've got a Magmatic Galleon here, which has played very, very well. It's a little bit expensive as just a removal spell, 5 mana for 5 damage, but you're also going to get a treasure token most likely, and you leave behind this 5-5 five, five vehicle that crews for only 2. So it's a pretty incredible defensive spell that helps you stabilize greatly, because you're going to kill your opponent's best creature, get a treasure token, and leave behind a 5-5 five, five blocker as long as you have like at least a 2 power creature on board. So it's super good on the defensive, and on the offensive it's pretty nice too, because you're going to clear out their best blocker and get a treasure token towards casting another spell pretty quickly. So I think Galleon is strong enough to scoop up here, even though we're not that deep into red, um, in case we do get to go in the green-red dino direction. Could also take the minecart, which is pretty great in literally anything. That'd be the safest pick. Uh, no matter what direction we go, we get to minecart it up, but... I think Galleon's a pretty sweet card, and we're going to scoop it up. Pack 2, pick 2, there is a Caparocti Sunborn here, which is really, really nice with that Discover ability. There's also a Colossodactyl for a big dino, sticking to our Paleontologist green-red build. Uh, I think Sunborn is kind of just insane. It's pretty busted. It's probably worth splashing, even, because discovering three every time you attack with it is nuts, and it's not that hard to have the extra artifact sitting on the board to to do that with so 
go for the Sunborn this time over the Dino. Pack two, pick three. There's a Plundering Pirate to give us a treasure to help splash around a little bit if we want to go like red, green, splash the white, or maybe red, white, splash the blue, something like that. Could be a good place to be. This is also two permanents off of the one spell, which is great with the Sunborn. Speaking of two permanents off one spell, there's also a Spyglass Siren here, which could be a big pickup for blue-white craft. We only have the gold-white cards, the Guide Murals and the Sunborns, so I'm feeling like maybe blue-red splash white or green-red splash white could be the, the spot here, which would mean we kind of want to have red be the color hinging together the deck here, where we go blue-red or green-red. So I think I take the Pirate over the Siren, even though the Siren is definitely a little better. Red is just an easier color to have as the glue holding our two different decks together. For pick four, we have a Triumphant Trump, which even if we're not in a Dino's deck, is going to be one mana, shoot something for two. And if we do end up in that Dino's deck, it's going to be even better, potentially shooting something for up to like seven damage for only one mana if we have our seven power cavern stomper on board. So we'll take the Triumphant Trump here. Fits in the deck no matter what. Uh, pick five, we've got Oaken Siren for the blue-red artifact deck. What do we have for Dinos? Pathfinding Axe Draw? Probably Axe Draw. I think that's probably a little better than the, uh, the Oaken Siren here. Pick that up as a solid addition. All right, for a green-red deck, even though it isn't a Dino itself, the Cenote Scout is awesome. One mana for a 1-1 one -one that explores, so no matter what, you're getting a very good deal for the mana cost. If you have a land on top, it's a 1-mana one 1-1 -man, one -one that draws a card, and if you don't, it's a 1-mana 2-2 two -two that surveils one. Either of those stat lines is incredible. So we'll take the Scout over the Seed Stones, which is also pretty solid. It's just a very, very different card. This is much more for uh, stabilizing and take over the, taking over the game in the late game, uh, whereas the Scout is just getting you started just super quick. Pick seven, we get the Kin Collar, which is great for the Green Red Dinos deck. Three mana, three, three that gains three life. Solid, solid card for uh, against more aggressive decks. Because Dinos is one of these slower, uh, more mid-rangey decks in terms of the decks that still primarily win by attacking in the early game. Dinos is like the slowest of the aggro decks, so it's nice to have ways to stabilize like that. Now we have a Malamet Brawler here, two mana, two, two. Trample while attacking. I think we are um, getting pretty committed towards green-red, maybe splash white for the Sunborn at this point. So we do need some filler two drops like that. Ooh, pick nine Scout. Absolutely take that card. Phenomenal stuff. Pick ten, get a Seeker of Sunlight. Or if we're really low on removal, we can take Runaway Boulder, but we're not. We have an Abraid and a Triumphant Chomp and a Magmatic Galleon, so I'll take the Seeker of Sunlight. Um, another Brawler here. I don't think we're going to be filling our grave super well for the Capybara, so let's take a Malamet Brawler. Let's uh, get our removal spells, our combat tricks, all that kind of stuff out of the mana curve and see... Uh, see how well our creatures are curving out here. Doesn't look bad. Three one drops, three two drops, three three drops, three four drops. Just three of everything, you know. Perfectly balanced. cave -in is pretty good if you get a lot of caves, but at this point it's definitely too late to try to scoop up a million caves. We do get to rare draft to hit the mother load for the collection, so that's cute. We do get a rare. All right, pack three, pick one, grab another braid here. Don't mind if I do. Twist and Turns is another pretty fun card if you have a lot of explore in your deck, and we do have two scouts and two axe draws, so it probably would not be terrible in here. And once you have seven lands on board, it turns into a pretty insane card draw engine. Four mana, tap it, dig through your deck for some creatures. So that card's pretty good too, as is the mine cart, but I'm just going to take more removal. I think a braid is also just mega premium removal in this format. Clears out all of the small creatures with its three damage, and a lot of the big creatures happen to be some craft cards that flip into like five fives or whatever, like the stone tree, and it takes all those out as well because they are artifacts. So I think a braid is just phenomenal in the format. Okay, pack three, pick two. Grab another kin collar for the middle of the curve here. Pretty happy to take that. Bristleback is fine as well, but you're not going to get seven mana all games, and two mana to forest cycle is a little inefficient. Bristleback is the best of the land cyclers. 
Um, but even then, we just don't want that many really high mana value things. I think I'll take the Kin Caller here over the Bristleback at just a much more consistent mana cost. You're going to hit every game. Now we could take a Bristleback because now it's just competing with a Cavalry or a Pickaxe, which I have found Pickaxe to be pretty fine, pretty solid. Um, but again, much better in red, blue, and red, white that have good ways to use those treasures. Here, they would just be for playing a dinosaur, which is a little less good. I guess when we have a Sunborn on board, getting all those extra treasure tokens is going to be super good, but generally speaking, not insane. Yeah, Bristleback, Pickaxe, Cavalry would all be pretty great here. Pretty fierce competition between the three. I guess with the curve, we have three two drops right now. We might actually want more two drops. Take a cavalry here. This one in a dedicated dinosaurs deck is also relatively consistently a two mana three three, which is pretty nice. Pick number four, we've got the tendril of the myco tyrant, a two mana two two. But if you make it to seven mana, you get to start turning all your lands into seven sevens one by one. So that's kind of spooky. Also, a Tali's Favor, which is always going to discover three when you play it, so it's always going to be worth the mana cost just for the discover alone, which is cute. But it is pretty high variance. It's pretty random, obviously. Could take another combat trick with the uh, Malamet Scythe, or could take some more mana ramp with the standard. We've actually ended up relatively low curves, so I don't think we need more mana ramp. I'll try out the Tendril here. I don't know how often we're making it to seven mana, but when we do, obviously the card's pretty nuts. Pick five, we've got a Pathfinding Axe draw again. Super consistent, just explore value. Love those kinds of creatures. And now we've got a three mana, four, three. It's got a little bit of extra text. If your opponent tries to play an instant during your turn, they're going to take some extra damage, which is super cool. If you try to play a spell during your opponent's turn, you're all, you'll also take the damage. But generally, if you're a red-green dinos deck, you're going to be doing everything at sorcery speed. So this will hurt your opponent more than you generally. The Waterwind Scout still here, pick six. I think that is one of the best blue commons. Incredible card. Pick seven now, we can get another Cavern Stomper to top things off, which is pretty nice. Uh, but Sahili's Lattice, actually. Make sure not to, uh, to skip by the Sahili's Lattice. Again, if you're just looking through a pack at a glance, it's really easy to see a big Cavern Stomper and be like, boom, there's a Dino, we're playing that. And really easy to not notice that Sahili's Lattice is a Dino card. But it is a dinosaur card, and it is a phenomenal one. It's a card draw spell for the deck that's going to also flip into a dino later. You just play it, discard a dinosaur, draw two cards, and on turn five, you get to flip it into a dinosaur with power equal to that dinosaur's power because you exile that dino from your graveyard later. So Lattice has been phenomenal in the dino decks. Now we can take a Sunfire Torch, which is Fine, mediocre removal if we end up needing more. Staggering size is a pretty great combat trick for the dino decks. Just absolutely overwhelm your opponent with a bunch of extra damage there. Now we take a Seeker of Sunlight. It's the only on-color card. Throw some nonsense into the sideboard for the rest of the draft, basically. Yeah, probably not playing the favor. Although I guess it's actually not bad on a 3-3 or a 4-3 or something. Could try out Atali's favor here. Take a blowgun. And I don't know if I got enough treasure tokens to try to put the sunboard in here in the end. We have one paleontologist. And that's it. Basically. One paleontologist, one plundering pirate for the Kaparakti Sunborn. Probably are just a pure green-red dinos deck with no splash at that point. And we got to cut four cards. 17 creatures, 10 non-creatures. Probably cut the stone tree with our curve being relatively nice and aggressive here and having no caves to flip the stone tree later. So it's just purely a mana ramp card in a deck that doesn't need much mana ramp. So we can drop that out immediately. Um, 17 creatures, 9 non-creatures. Yeah, I mean, Lattice is basically another 5-mana creature. We just play the card draw spell early and then flip it into a dino turn 5, so we're kind of at like 18 creatures here and a vehicle, so we can certainly cut one or two. I think the Seeker of Sunlight's probably the least exciting creatures. I guess the Brawler's 
or the Micro Tyrant without a lot of mana ramp. And I suppose the Pirate doesn't hit too many synergies here. So these are the potential creature cuts. We need to cut three cards. If I cut the Sunfire Torch here, then I'll still have a Triumphant Chomp, two Abrade, and a Magmatic Galleon, which I think is pretty good. So let's cut like the Torch and then two of these creatures. Could go one Seeker, one Brawler. Split it down the middle. Or I could, would I rather have three one drops and four two drops or two one drops and five two drops? Probably rather have five two drops, honestly. Do it like that. I think that looks pretty good to me. Cut the double seeker. Call it a deck here. All right, here we have a final look at the deck list for today. We're on a pretty standard red green dinos build with a lot of of exploration to set up our draws. We've got two of the scouts here, three of the axe draws, and those should really keep our draws pretty consistent, picking up extra lands or surveilling the next cards into the graveyard. We've got a really consistent curve in general with plenty of stuff to do throughout the game, and some extra card draw with Sahili's Lattice here and Atali's Favors potentially discovering a card. We've got Kind of just all the consistent stuff you want without anything particularly crazy. We've got some decent removal with some chomps, some braids, and a magmatic galleon. Some combat tricks to break through with a couple staggering sizes. And that's pretty much the deck. For the rares in this deck, they're mainly just support pieces, like the Paleontologist for Mana Ramp that might be able to cast some dinos from the grave later, and the galleon for another removal spell that can get crewed into a vehicle. So... Pretty standard deck here, nothing crazy going on, just a decent curve, solid card draw with a bunch of explore and one or two little card draw spells with Lattice and Favor, and uh, solid removal, just everything you kind of want. Pretty basic stuff today, but looks pretty solid, so without further ado, let's head into the gameplay and see how it does. Here we are on the play for game one with a great curve. We get to start by exploring on turn one, seeing what we're going to draw into. It is another land, but we've dug it out of the way here. Then turn two, we get to drop the Paleontologist on board so that on turn three, I can cast both of my other two drop cards. Our opponent drops a Warden of the Inner Sky, which we need to find some removal to kill as soon as possible. Because if this sits around, it's going to keep getting extra plus one plus one counters on it by them tapping three of their permanents, and they can tap the Warden to its own ability. And of course, they have the Deep Cavern Bat to make us discard our removal spell, the Magmatic Galleon, so they can protect the Warden, which is pretty bad for us, because that was our plan, to not just die to a Warden of the Inner Sky. They just had the Warden, we'd be fine, we had the removal spell, but they had to double it up with a Thought Seize. And at this point, we have to just mill into removal for the Warden as quickly as possible. Um, so we're going to mill the Kin Color. And the other thing that's kind of nice about doing that is the fact that the Paleontologist can cast it from the Grave later anyway. Um, so we're definitely milling basically anything that isn't a removal spell on any Explore cards that we draw. So I guess I play the Cavalry over the Brawler um, and we pass from here. Well, I think I actually attack with the Paleontologist because in order to kill it, they have to double block with the Warden and the Bat, and then I can either kill the Warden so I don't need a removal spell for it, or I can kill the Bat so that I can draw the removal spell for it. So, definitely send the Paleontologist in there. Alright, cool. So, I mean, we still have quite some time to draw into the removal, because they still didn't put a counter on the Warden yet. Although... A couple of the removal spells in this deck will only deal 3 damage, both our copies of Abrade and our Triumphant Chomp. So actually, pretty much all the removal that's left, we need to do it before they get 2 counters on this, so we actually only have like 1 turn left to draw the removal. Nothing we can do about that, there's no way to draw a card here, right? Because this only recasts Dinos, I can't recast a Scout if I get one in Grave. Nope. So... Now they have a Necromage, which is going to be an annoying blocker because it's going to trade and leave behind some Funguses to tap the, the Warden for. 
So I suppose we awkwardly just recast Kin Collar here. I think so. So this attacks as a 3 3. That just trades into the Necromage, and they have two cards to tap towards it. But I could send them with both. At least I poke them for two that way. I mean, this is bad either way. If I don't trade with the Necromage, if they play any other creature, they can still put a counter on the Warden, but that would involve tapping, like, all their stuff. Yeah, I guess I'll just pass here, because if I give them two Fungus Tokens, they have some really free cards to tap, because they can't block anyway. But now if they want to put a counter on the Warden, they're actually locking down three of their blockers and opening a path for all of our board to hit them for a bunch of damage. Because the Warden is a sorcery speed effect. So we probably try to use that to our advantage, get them to where they want to tap for the Warden, and then they have no blocks up and we just jam in. Alright, Atali's Favor is a great draw here, because it can discover an Abrade or a Triumphant Tromp or something. Let's throw it on our biggest creature for extra trample damage, probably. Although... I guess I'm going to test the water, see if it seems like they have an instant. No potential response to Brawler, it seemed like, so I think we do put it on our biggest creature. Definitely an argument for putting it on a smaller one, so if they have the removal spell to two for one us, at least they kill a smaller creature. Okay, so now if they want to kill the Kin Caller, they have to double block and lose two creatures. So they lose two creatures and then get two back, two Fungus Tokens here. Um, but they could also just block with only the Necromage just to get the Fungus Tokens. Be a little little bad. I think it's attack with just Kin Caller or attack with the whole board. But I think we are attacking here. Yeah, let's go for that outrace here, send in the whole board. So the minor argument for not attacking with Paleontologist, but we have no other dinosaurs on the board right now that we're ever going to be able to recast anyway. Ew. Cosmium Blast is definitely solid. Uh, but yeah, Paleontologist isn't going to do anything until we get more dinos in Grave, and we don't know how long that's going to take with no more dinos on the board at all. Oof. Queen's Bay Paladin to reanimate one of their creatures they traded off with, and now they have a million creatures on board to tap for the Warden, because they just got two creatures off the one spell. One final turn to draw into an Abrade. Triumphant Chomp does not work anymore. Oh, well, that's not an Abrade. And now I think it's just too late. Yep. Yeah, we can't attack in anymore against the Four Toughness card. The Warden is going to be a Flying Vigilant threat soon. Oh wow, and it just gets an extra counter from the Aspirant to speedrun it. Now they just tap the two Funguses in the Aspirant. And they have Helping Hand for the Necromage. Alright. I mean, I don't think there was much we could do this game. We had to hope to maybe outrace the Warden or top deck removal for it quick enough. And we tried to get some damage in, and we just did not draw into removal for it, so that's going to be game. I mean, that is literally just... If one single thing changed about this game, I think we would be in a perfectly solid position to be winning. And that one thing is just trade any of these two drops for an Abrade. And I think if Warden died here, like, we can fight through a Queen's Bay Paladin and still win. Oh my god. We just couldn't get through the Warden. I guess at this point I probably should have kept the Axe Draws, honestly. But, no, actually it doesn't matter, because even the Axe Draws don't get through a... It's going to be a 5-6 next turn, so they wouldn't even be attacking. Yeah, no. Just getting destroyed by the Warden. I don't know what we're even scrying into, though, getting rid of the Axe Draws. 
they don't help us at all, but I don't think there's anything else in our deck that does at this point with how big the Warden has gotten. Just the removal spell or bust kind of game. And for us, this game was a bust. One turn from lethal. See what our final draw is. Another land, since we scryed the axe draws away. Can't even hit them because they can just block with the whole board on the ground, and then we die in the sky. That is game. 0 oh, and 1 to start it off. All right, here we are now for game number two on the draw against a turn one Sunfire Torch. That's going to add some extra damage to whatever they equip it to, and then it's going to clear out a creature whenever they want to sack it and do so. Blue-Red, one of the most aggressive decks in the format, potentially. So a little scared to see our opponent on Blue-Red on the play, but they did not have a two-mana creature, at least, which is very nice for us. They have a Lodestone Needle instead to just tap our cavalry, have it sit there for a second. And they're just going to pass turn, stuck on two mana. Okay. We could get stuck on mana as well here with three four drops having been drawn this game. So if we don't hit the fourth land next turn, things are going to be a little awkward for all of our little headlamps over here. Our nightlight dinosaurs. There's an Oaken Siren. That is mana for them, but it's mana that I can blow up. This might be wrong, but I'm just going to chomp the Siren to cut them off their mana rather than playing an Axe Draw right now. Hope for two. There's a Staunch Crewmate, which digs for an artifact or a pirate from the top four and puts it in their hand. And they do find a subterranean schooner, a rare. Two mana, three, four, crews for only one. And whenever it attacks the creature that crewed it explores, that is a great card. That is super nice uh, card draw. And it digs for lands for them as well. All right, here's our pathfinding axe draw. Which does draw us our land, which is great. We send in the team, we trample up the brawler, because that's what they're going to block if they block since they can't trade into the cavalry anyway. Boom, trample over for a little bit, clear out the pirate, and now they need another creature to crew the schooner. But because the schooner's going to have summoning sickness, they would, if they want to play it, just play it this turn um, to get rid of the summoning sickness and then play any creature next turn to crew it. All right, they find the third land off of the puzzle door, which digs for the best card in the top two. Uh, we can... Axe draw, and if I hit a land, have a staggering size up. Yeah, we can only play one dinosaur here, so play the biggest one, which is Axe draw. Find a scout. I'll keep it. Scout's super reasonable. Hit for seven, and they are down to seven. Staggering size probably guarantees lethal next turn against whatever they're trying to do. But we'll see. Idol of the Deep King, kill the cavalry. All right. They are just going to concede. They cannot find a way to uh, stop the lethal on board. And we are going to be one and one now. Some rough luck for our opponent. But that does balance out our record at one and one heading into round number three. All right, here we are on the play for game three. I'm going to keep this. We could end up in our opponent's position here because I really need the third land. But if we hit the third land, we're good on everything else. It's just finding the third land that's an issue. Could cash in a lattice right now to make sure that I have the third land next turn to cast Plundering Pirate and go from there. We discard the Kin Caller to have a dinosaur in our graveyard. I could also get a little greedy here and just play the Brawler. Um, and then no matter what, I have something that I can trade into Tomb Raider. And if I miss the land, I just play Lattice next turn and go a little slow from there. I think I'm fine with that. 
we'll play the Brawler here. And then if we hit a land, we get to play Pirate. If we don't, we still get to Lattice. We just do that a turn later. All right, Sunshot Militia. They can poke me for one with its ability, but they choose not to. They could tap both those. I guess it's because they would hit me for one and then I hit them for two, so that does make sense. A Braid is a fantastic draw. First draw of a Braid of the day, I think. Uh, let's... I want to abrade anything here. I could attack in holding up Staggering Size or Abrade. It's cute, but they probably just don't block and I just hit for two. And it's whatever. Yeah, let's just Lattice. Get our land drops. And there we go. We certainly get our land drops. Next turn looks like a pretty ideal turn to... Um, Staggering size. Alright, still not getting poked by the militia here at all. I could pirate, spend the treasure to staggering size if they block in a way that makes me want to do that. Or I could just hold up staggering size of braid when I attack in. Let's hold up the double here. Just poke for two if they don't block. It's fine. Cool. Then I play the pirate and I abrade the raptor, and we pass from there. Because we have the fifth land in hand anyway, so we don't need to keep the treasure around. Especially because I'll get another treasure off the galleon next turn. Petrify my pirate, now I take two damage. Oof. Ooh, there's a cavern stomper, which I can cast off the treasure I'll be getting off the galleon. But they only have a 1-2 and a 1-3 here, and they don't have a wide enough board state to really use the Militia well for a bunch of damage. So I'm not that scared of their current board state. Honestly, just make a 3-3 seems fine to me for the turn. Save Galleon for something scarier. Oh, it's a 3-4. I forgot it has 4 toughness on the back. Nice. Cool. Holds off their attacks, and it's going to attack in pretty well as well. We've got the staggering size up, so, I mean, attacks are free. Trample up the raptor here. I'm fine with this. I don't think I want a staggering size and open myself up to getting... Um, well, I guess we could get got by an idol of the Deep King, but if they had a braid, they would just kill the raptor anyway. But no, I'm, I'm cool with this still, I think. Because the Tomb Raider is really easily going to be a 2-2 at some point. So I'll just save the Staggering Size for another combat. I'm cool trading the 2-2 into their potential 2-2. And they must just have some powerful 4-mana spells in hand there, because... Don't find a f uh, fourth land, and they just concede on the spot. We are two and one, heading into game four. Here we are for game four with our mono green deck. Let's go. Turn one, scout. Turn two, brawler. Turn three, kin caller. That's a curve and a half right there. We are on the draw, so it's not going to be an overwhelming curve, but it's still going to be a fantastic one. So what do we hit turn one? Off the explore, we hit a paleontologist, which I will absolutely keep. And that's our red source, even. There's a deep cavern bat. I don't know what they're going to exile here, but they can exile whatever they want. Maybe the staggering size. Maybe the kin caller. So we just play a two drop next turn and a two drop the turn after that. I don't know. I mean, they're all pretty equivalently powerful. They hit the two drop. Well, I mean, they knew I was going to draw a better two drop. But, again, all of their choices there were pretty comparably powerful, so it's whatever. I don't know what's actually right there. Poke me for one, gain one life off the deep cavern bat. And the Visage of Dread hits the board, makes me discard the Kin Collar, but I can just cast it from Grave if my Paleontologist sticks around. 
probably supposed to play the mountain, even though it gives them perfect information on what's in my hand. Just so I have it on the board for later. I don't have any double red cards, though. Well, no, I've got Magmatic Galleon. Yeah, I'm probably supposed to play the mountain. Just in case of Magmatic Galleon. I've only got four mana up here, so that's why I didn't immediately exile the Kin Caller to recast it. We'll exile it in their end step here uh, and go for the recast next turn. Vito's Inquisitor. Okay, they're tapped out, so we don't have to be worried about them killing Paleontologist before I cast Kin Caller. Another land. Little bit of flood here, but not horrific. Um, Sen and the team holding up the Staggering Size and then cast the Kin Color, because we don't have to cast it with mana from this, do we? Yeah, we don't have to, so. If they block, we Staggering Size. If they don't, we cast Kin Color. Either one of the two is going to be a solid play here. Well, they know we have Staggering Size and they're tapped out. I guess they just want to get it out of here, not worry about it right now. Okay. Well, we're not casting Kin Caller this turn then, so if they kill Paleontologist, they will be exiled forever, but we can at least use Paleontologist to exile another card before it dies, so we can mill one of the two creatures that they target here. Oh, it doesn't target this one. Return up to two. Yeah, that's... Oh my god. I should have exiled in response. I hate cards that work like that. Where they don't actually target, so you're not allowed to respond as soon as the spell's on the stack. You have to exile before that. So I should have exiled before that, because they didn't mill any other creatures. That would have been really gross if I did. Loose. But fine. Let's see. We've got six mana now. Not enough to play Axtraw and Kin Caller. Axtraw is the better play, but if Kin if Paleontologist dies, then Kin Caller can't be cast. I think I do play Axtraw. Find a scout? Sure. Perfectly happy with that. Alright, so very important little learning moment here with another chance. You have to respond before the spell goes on the stack. I didn't respond before it went on the stack because I'm used to the return two target creatures from your grave to hand things where we would want to wait until they mill and then choose the two targets. And once they choose the two targets, we exile one of the targets with Paleontologist, whichever one's better. Um, but we can't do that against that spell specifically. So good learning moment there to know that for the future. Okay, just find a land off the scout, so just get that out of the way. Inquisitor's a big blocker here. If that was the only creature in their hand, then yeah, that was a big... big miss on not being able to kill that thing here. Now they might just have the 4 damage to an attacker or blocker thing on the axe draw. We don't have any way to play around that, we'll just recast it from Graveyard after they do that, which is actually pretty solid for us. Yeah, this is fine, because we have the mana to immediately recast it from Grave and explore again, which should be great. Paleontologist is doing work this game. Hit a Cavern Stomper? Let's go. That is a finisher right there. Tithing Blade. There goes the 1-1. One, one. Now I don't even feel bad about the scout coming out as a 1-1 one, one instead of a 2-2. Two, two. It gave us the perfect little sack fodder. Alright, we send in the axe draw and slam down a cavern stomper. Ooh, that's an instant speed ability. I was not paying attention. I guess they could sack their whole board to kill the axe draw, but they'd have to sack the bat too to do that. If they want to kill the axe draw without losing their creature, that is. Okay, trade is fine. Scry into the galley and a braid. Those are some draws. Those are some draws I'm very happy with. 
all the exploring and scrying and stuff in this deck is just playing out really, really well. But this game has been a lot of great paleontologist value. Well, I guess we only actually cast one card off the paleontologist in the end. Just the Pathfinding Axtra. We've had the Kincaller sitting here forever. So it has just been a lot of exploration. There's a 1-1 Flying Lifelinker with no Enter the Battlefield effect. R.I.P. Poke us for one. Alright, end step. Might as well exile their creature now. Now we galleon up the bat and hit for nine. Yeah, I'm going to draw into an abrade if I need to hit something else. Just clear the path. And there's the concession from our opponent. We are three and one now, guaranteeing at least an even 50-50 run as we head into game five. Just had to vehicular manslaughter a bat. All right, here we are for game five. Not a great curve here. Not starting till turn three, but the hand is still very nice, having both colors and some very valuable spells, turn three and turn four. And we never didn't have it. We draw the two drop, and now we've got an excellent curve on the play. Probably drop the favor once the axe draws on board, make that a big trampling threat. There is a Zoyoa Lava Tongue, which I might just want to kill immediately. Beginning of the end step, if they descended, we can discard a card, sack a permanent, or take three. Well, I'll just take three damage for a little while, uh, so I can keep curving out here. Yeah, I'll just take the extra damage if they descend, for now. But we'll probably abrade that soon, so they don't have a death toucher to clear out a big trampling axe draw or something like that. Ooh, Preacher of the Schism is a gross card. Every time that it attacks... Never mind. Disregard. It doesn't matter what it does, because I drew the chomp. Uh, base, every time it attacks, they get some amount of value. They get a 1-1 lifelinker, or they get to draw a card and lose a life. But Triumphant Chomp was such a perfect draw there, where we get to use the treasure from the pirate to play the axe draw and the chomp in the same turn, and play the chomp as a one-mana removal spell to kill their four-toughness preacher. Just actually, like, the greatest draw possible. But here's a look at that preacher if you want to read that. Really solid stuff, no matter what your life total is at. It's an army in a can, or it's a card draw engine. And both are quite good. Here's an Idol of the Deep King. Three mana to clear out one of our creatures. The rest of our board remains. We can scout into favor, so I can see exactly what I might discover here before I do it, potentially. Unless I hit a land. Galleon. Okay, well, now I just want to draw Galleon. So I'm not going to discover, because if I discover three and I hit a five drop, the five drop's going to go to the bottom of my library. So that lets us just not get the extra one point of damage right now and just hold up in a braid instead to kill whatever blocker they play. And they don't even have a blocker they want to play. They're going to concede, and we are now four and one, heading into game number six. All right, here we are for game six. Two drop, three drop favor here. A little high on mana. We could definitely flood out. That is the risk of the hand. But uh, it's got both the colors, and it's got some good plays for turn 2, 3, and 4. So I'm still happy with it. And we did immediately draw a 6-mana spell, which is actually a great draw for a hand that has this much mana. So happy to find the Cavern Stomper to top off the curve. And when the Stomper hits the battlefield, it lets us scry 2 and uh, dig out of any extra lands from that point on. Here's an Abrade. I could use to kill the torch, but I think I would rather just kill a creature with it and we just let them torch our 3 2 pirate, I guess. Just curve out for now. In order for them to torch something next turn, they'd have to play a haste creature because they have to sacrifice a torch when they're attacking to fling the torch at our, our creature. Oh, they're just going to abrade a pirate. Well, that's pretty solid for me. 
get the instant speed removal out of the way before I try to cast an Atali's favor. Oh yeah, I'm really happy with that. Now they tap out for a Cloud Guard. I do top deck the Galleon, and we got the Abrade out of the way before the Galleon. All right, well, let's Galleon it up now. We get to replace the Treasure Token with Galleon's ability so we can still Cavern Stomper next turn. And sure, they can go ahead and kill our Brawler um, with their Torch, but that's fine. So we're going to have a 7-7 soon enough, and we've got a 5-5 we can crew pretty easily with basically any creature in our deck. If we play one of our 1-1s one that explores and it doesn't uh, get a plus one plus one counter, then that won't be able to single-handedly crew it, but I think most of our cards will. Okay, so I can Cavern Stomper, or I can kill this Child of the Volcano before it gets any plus one plus one counters. If I wait just one turn, they're going to use the Torch to kill the Brawler and descend in the same turn to make that a 4-4. Four, four. So, I think I want to abrade the child here instead of just playing a cavern stomper just to stop that whole descend combo shenanigans. And then, by playing abrade plus favor, I'll have a 3-3 three, three on board, so I have nothing small enough to die to the torch on board anymore. So sure, let's favor first and see what we hit, because maybe I'll discover an abrade. And I'll just cast it for free instead. I discover a Kin Caller, which is a super reasonable play. Might as well gain the life. We're going to be casting the Stomper next turn anyway. Crew the Galleon. That was a great discover off the favor here. They are down to 8 life, and we have no creatures on board small enough for them to torch. Next turn we get to attack with two 3-3s three and a 5-5, five five, because I can crew the 5-5 five five with the Cavern Stomper. Yes, yeah, so they're going to hold the blockers up so they could chump block, or they can double block the Galleon to kill the, my biggest attacker here. Find an Abrade. Don't hate it. I'll keep that one. If I attack with Galleon and two 3-3s, three if they block a 3-3, three three, they block the 3-3 three three Trampler. Right, I give Galleon Trample. So they block a 3-3 three three Trampler, and then they chump there, take 5, go to 3 life. Is it worth losing a 3-3 three three here? To put them to 3 life? With it a braid coming up, I feel like it probably is. So we lose the brawler and hit for five. They have to chump the 3-3 three, three to not die. I guess they could chump the galleon instead if they want to go to one life, but that's obviously worse for them. So now, yeah, I was going to say now if they don't get a second blocker, they're just dead by attacking like that. And if they do get a second blocker and it's small enough to die to an abrade or it's an artifact, then they're also still dead because we're drawing into an abrade. So solid stuff there. We are now five and one guaranteed in the money from here. Fantastic draft today. Super happy with that. At 1600 gems and four packs as the prizes out of this 1500 gems event, that is a going infinite kind of draft here. Here we are for game number seven, exploring all day long again. Got that turn one scout, definitely a keepable hand. I don't know what we're going to discard to Lattice, but... Loving the hand otherwise. Scout into the Tendril. Although Tendril, uh, much more impactful turn seven onward. But I'll still play it rather than the uh, Lattice immediately. Uh-oh, Stalactite Stalker can be disgusting. Gets a plus one plus one counter in their end step if they descended this turn. So as long as they have stuff going into their graveyard going to keep getting bigger and then they can just use it as a removal spell later all right we find the axe draw we can discard that to the lattice to draw two and have a dinosaur engrave so that looks solid to me i could also just keep curving out aggressively and that's also fine because we've got three out of the four mana for the axe draw so we might just play it turn four honestly let's probably do that
keep playing our stuff post combat so we have staggering size up if they have a weird black combat trick that I'm not thinking of because I am still not uh, not well familiar with all the instant speed shenanigans in the format it's pretty brand new Atali's favor of their own on the stalactite stalker and they discover a lodestone needle to slow down one of our two drops which is fine get the brawler stunned I see and they're going to jam in for two. We find the Triumphant Chomp for the Stalker, and that's a great draw here. So let's go Tendril plus Chomp. I could... Well, I can't Lattice and Chomp because I don't have double red. So yeah, well, that just makes the decision for me. Even if I could Lattice Chomp, I think, again, I still kind of don't want to discard the Axe Draw until next turn when I know that I'm not drawing... A fourth land because if i discard this axe draw to draw two and then the next card in my deck is a land i would just much rather have played it next turn then ditched it because that explore enter the battlefield effect as we have seen is solid solid value all right opponent finds zoyoa lava tongue which just trades one for one to either the creatures which is perfectly reasonable I can Lattice ditch the Cavern Stomper so that when I craft this, I get a 7-4 instead now. Um, and probably draw land. No, I was going to say, and probably draw land for Staggering Size. Um, but it, I don't think we need Staggering Size against one black mana. Yeah, we don't need the Staggering Size anyway. Even if I hit the fourth land, I wouldn't have cast it there. Unless they cast something of their own. Tithing Blade. Well, technically Brawler is slightly better than the Scout once it's on board, so we'll sack the Scout, and there's the fourth land. Beautiful. A little bit late, but perfectly fine to show up now. Still in a great position, getting two Explore Triggers going. Could take a Staggering Size, I'm just going to ditch it. Look for more creatures. Because we're going to be tapping out for another Axe Draw next turn, so it's going to be a good amount of time before I have two mana up to play around with that, right? Because once once I have five mana, I'm just going to make a 7-4, and if I don't hit the, the fifth land, I'm just going to play an Axe Draw. So we have something to do next turn and the turn after that, so not playing a Staggering Size for quite some time. Our opponent's trying to find some outs here. They go ahead and use their Restless Vents to discard a card and draw a card. <sighs> scout would be a greedy play if i play scout and i hit any basic land i can play axe draw on the same turn whereas if i play axe draw and hit specifically a forest i can play the scout and i already have three forests so i'm a little more likely to hit a mountain than forest so i could try to max greed it up play the scout hope to hit a land to play the axe draw as well um but i think i just play the axe draw hit Atali's favor. Let's ditch that. We're looking for a fifth land for the Lattice. Opponent is down to five now. So I don't think Scout would have been a horrible play because, again, worst case scenario, we don't hit a land. We still play the Cavalry alongside it. We still get multiple creatures on the board, but just be mana efficient. Get the guaranteed four mana of usage out of the axe draw and here's the fifth mana staggering size just straight kills them on board already though so all right actually we didn't even need the staggering size one blocker was not enough to stop multiple five power creatures against our five life opponents so another solid quick victory with some beefy dinos some great setup of all of our draws with a bunch of explore going on with the scouts and the uh the axe draws the sahili's lattice being great it's really solid, really consistent stuff there, and we are now 6-1, and one, heading into the final battle with two rounds in the chamber. Here we are now for the final battle, at least the first round of it. We've got kind of an awkward hand here where literally everything in the hand costs 3 mana, so we're clumped up there. But it's got both of our colors and some very reasonable plays, so we are going to keep it here. Our opponent is on the play. They start with a Ruin Lurker Bat. They immediately descend by plane cycling a soaring sandwing next turn so they'll get to draw land and scry one off of this ruin lurker bat and they're going to scry it back to the top we hit a galleon for later in the game which is great love having the double kin collar here to uh make up for some lost life early in the game 
I'm gonna start with the Raptor here, because if they have instant speed removal, it's gonna be much better than playing a Kin Collar. Oh yeah. Love to see that. Sure, they're gonna gain some of this life back with the Ruin Lurker Bat. But it's still much better to see them join the dead, the Raptor, than a Kin Collar, since we get the damage out of it. Ooh, great draw. Now we drop a Pathfinding Axe draw here. We're definitely worried about them having four power of flyers in the sky. Um, I mean, Brawler can crew Galleon. But I think we are looking for bigger stuff than two drops here, so I'll still ditch it. Anyways, a little worried about four power in the sky, but we have the Galleon to clear out the Cloud Guard, which helps a lot. And then we're back to just taking one damage a turn from that point on. Got a hidden Necropolis so they can ditch a land to discover later. Are they trying to get our Axe Draw to attacker block to deal four to it? No, they're just going to Bitter Triumph it. Okay. That's fine. Find a Triumphant Chomp. So now I have the removal to kill both the Flyers eventually. I want to start with the Galleon so that I get the treasures to use. I could kill both right now, I guess. Kind of want to hold on to Chomp just in case they play something better than Bats. Although I guess as long as they don't play another Flyer, we'll be fine. Yeah, I have six points of life gain in hand and I'm at 12. I don't need to immediately kill this Bat here. We'll save Tromp in case they play another Flyer. Maybe they'll play Graveyard Recursion and recast the Cloud Guard, because they do keep looking at their Graveyard here. Ooh, Tinker's Tote off of the Discover. Very solid pickup. A couple more 1-1s one -ones for them, but we can block those all day long with a couple Kin Callers. Let's cry one off the bat. I mean, maybe it's worth killing the bat just because of all of the scry that they're getting. But luckily enough for us, uh, they are just consistently scrying to the top, so they haven't actually like dug any deeper in their deck with it. Could go kin collar plus kin collar, or I could go kin collar lattice here. I kind of want to see what we get off lattice. Let's ditch this forest to draw because we already have plenty of dinos in grave to make this like a 10-4 or something, an 8-4 I guess. We do hit a land, so I can play a Scout and a Kin Collar, or a Chomp and a Kin Collar. Or I could flip the Lattice. With the Treasure Token, I could play all of these. Let's Scout. Hope that it gets the counter. That'd be awesome. It does get the counter. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 lands on board for the Tendril. Ooh, that is actually a 7-7 seven, seven coming up. Okay. Now we can call her and gain some life. Again, I could chomp the bat just to stop all the scry and the life gain, because they do have a Tinker's Tote to sacrifice, which will descend again. I feel like somehow it's just going to go so bad if I do this, they're just going to play a 3-2 flyer again. So, I don't know. Chomp is going to be big enough to kill literally anything. Because we can flip a, an 8 power dinosaur the turn that we play the Chomp. So even if they draw like a Soaring Sandwing for a 3-5 flyer, the Chomp can kill that. So I think I'm just holding on to this thing. Another Ruin Lurker Bat. Well, maybe at some point we just kill one of the two. Another Tote. It's going to be so much descending. We got to find one of our things that gives Trample here break through all this. Got so much life gain going, too. Snap. I guess I milled the trample dork earlier, because I was like, eh, it's not gonna matter, but if I had it with an 8 power dino, actually kind of would've. Okay. No exploring or, sc or um, scrying or drawing any cards right now, so... Can make it 8 4, can make a kin collar and a tendril, can shoot a bat. I guess kin collar, tendril, shoot a bat here, and then 
Uh, I have two treasure tokens left behind, which means I've got the mana to make two seven sevens over time. Fifteen life. I really don't feel like I need to hold up that many blockers here. Kill two one ones, take three seems reasonable enough to get them to not attack here. And they might triple block Kin Collar, and that's fine. I doubt they block Galleon with five creatures, but I guess that is also something that might happen. That would be very good for me. I think if they try to kill either of these, it's just great for me. Because we just clear out all the chump blockers to get damage in next turn. How does this thing work? Does give the land haste. Doesn't give trampler anything. Okay, so I could... Crack both my treasures to immediately attack with the 7-7 seven, seven next turn, rather than having a tapped 7-7 seven, seven off of the Tendril. Which might be worth it, I don't know. One card in hand here now. They can sack their Tinker's Tote to gain some life and scry. The one card in hand kills the 7-7 seven, seven producer. Sad day. But, I think this is a board state we can very slowly start winning the game with. They have to draw onto something to get back into a winning position here. Otherwise, they don't have infinite chump blocks, but they do have one more scry from this ru Ruin Lurker Bat, at least, to uh, to try to find something good. They do scry to the bottom. All right, Scout's a great draw. Always happy to see that. Dig through our deck here, find a Burning Sun Cavalry. Yeah, I'll just take more threats, sure. Let's flip our Lattice. As an 8-4. Boom. Big Dino hits the board. We crew the Galleon with the Scout. 14 life. Honestly, attack with all now. Block 1, take 4 on the crackback is fine. Maybe we should have just attacked all last turn, too. Alright, couple trades it is. They need to draw something fast now. Because now they have no chump blockers left. I guess they can chump block with the Ruin Lurker Bat, which they actually will have to do chump block the 8-4. But that would be take 3, take 8 extra damage next turn. Because this scout crews the galleon, so that gets in for five and the kin car gets in for three. All right, they're down to ten. They can chump block raptor and take eight, but they gain one from the bat, so they'll they'll be at three life after that happens. But in a very losing position from there, and that is the concession from our opponent. That is a seven win run from a very sweet dinosaur deck here that didn't look like it was going to happen. Uh, honestly, pack one, we just didn't see a lot in green or red towards dinosaurs, but that managed to turn around pretty well for us later on in the pack and moving into pack two and onward. So yeah, pretty happy with, uh, with how I drafted, how it played out. We got pretty lucky, weren't in any positions where we had to make any uh, really difficult decisions gameplay-wise, which is definitely helpful for me. Um, yeah, we had the speculation towards the Double Master's Guide Mural Craft deck, but just found enough good dino stuff and opened up like a galleon, like a great red card, to uh, stick to our green-red guts, and worked out super well for us. So as for overperformers and underperformers, as for learning moments here today, uh, one of them is definitely that um, the, uh, the graveyard recursion in this format, that black instant spell that mills two and then picks up two cards, does not target, it just picks up the cards as part of its resolution, so you need to exile before that spell um, before that spell starts doing its ability, because it doesn't choose any targets, you can't respond in the middle of them casting it. So that was a big learning moment for the future to try to keep in mind uh, if you're playing against that 
uh, that instant from your opponent. As for underperformers, overperformers, things that we liked a lot here, mainly the Explorer was just fantastic. I mean, we already knew how good Explorer was as a mechanic, but today's gameplay was just a big showing of how great the Explorer ability is, getting several 1-mana 2-2 two -two scouts out, and really um, just keeping the deck drawing really consistently with all of these Explorer Enter the Battlefield creatures to set up our future draws, find what we're looking for there. So that was awesome. And of course, alongside all the Explorer, the Sahili's Lattice for some more um, card draw to keep the deck drawing what it needs consistently. And this also flipping into a big dino later, so you're not even... Uh, you're not even playing a card that is strictly card draw. It's card draw and a finisher later on. So really nice stuff from the deck. Very happy with today's draft. But that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you're interested in seeing some more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you more on your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. If you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.